Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. I, I think that's the first time I've had mentioned in my introduction about me shooting a gun at 11 <laughs> and getting my doctoral degree at Johns Hopkins. Uh, but, but thank you, it's, it's such a, uh, so nice to be here with you today. I appreciate the invitation and um, look forward to when we get to the time where we'll have the Q&A. But uh, I'm gonna cover some ground. Uh, some of it's gonna be data-oriented, some of it's gonna be sort of idea-oriented, uh, but um, hopefully it all connects. Um, just uh, to start, and, and being a person in public health, um, our focus is on what impact this problem has on health, um, on mortality, morbidity, and what we can do about it. So um, the most recent year we have complete data on all forms of gun deaths. Uh, there were over 31,000 such deaths in the United States. What many people don't realize that in states like Arkansas and many other states, it's actually suicides are far more common that are homicides with guns. But nevertheless, we have more than 11,000 uh, gun homicides per year. Uh, based upon data from the National Crime Victimization Survey, we estimate over 300,000 times a year in which uh, individuals are victimized uh, in a crime with, with a gun. Most typically, they're not shot. Um, and 73,000 injured severely enough with a gunshot wound that they needed hospital treatment. Um, an economist recently released a study where they, he estimated that the social cost in a single year from gun violence in the United States is $174 billion with a B. Uh, has a huge cost on our, our society. As was mentioned, in part it has to do with property values. If you think about if someone is shot in your neighborhood or maybe that happens on far too frequent of a basis. You can imagine what it does to your property values, right? Uh, so it's great consequence uh, in many domains in terms of our, um, not only mortality, morbidity, but uh, psychological cost and economic well-being. Very commonly when, when uh, we talk about this issue publicly, and particularly some of the news coverage of it, we think about these, the mass shootings. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, recognize this image of, of teachers and students coming out of um, Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. You might also recognize uh, some of these images. These were from the, um, I believe it's the Safeway uh, in Tucson, where uh, Gabrielle Giffords and several other people were shot that day. I think I now figured out that I can do it. And then when we think about perpetrators of gun violence, we think about individuals like Jared Loeffner and Adam Lanza, people who perpetrate some of these mass shootings. And all, most of the conversation, unfortunately, centers around these sorts of incidents that are really important and, and gripping and terrifying kind of incidents. But I think that they really can skew our thinking about the what the problem is and what the solutions might be to it. So um, much was made of the fact that Jared Loeffner got his gun legally, for example. And many people, um, one of the things that I hope to convey in this talk today is the general idea about law-abiding gun owners, legal gun owners, and not as if anybody who, who can pass a background check is nevertheless completely uh, has zero risk associated with committing violent crime. That's typically not the case. So in Arizona, for example, the, the standards are relatively um, not particularly high, as is the case in Arkansas and many other states. Um, so, but he had a checkered past that, that should have made us quite concerned about him owning guns. But, um, but our policies, uh, in essence, the default is you, you, you can have a gun and as many as you want and take it pretty much wherever you want it loaded. Uh, far less attention is, is paid to some of the, the, the more common kinds of things. So uh, this is Bobby Ray Bordeaux. Um, he's from North Carolina and he, um, after getting in a, a fight at a bar, um, he shot 
and murdered Cliff Jackson. And John Warwick uh, tried to come in and break up the fight, and he was uh, non-fatally wounded in that incident. Um, Mr. Bordeaux um, had a permit to carry a concealed weapon, and he did so. He carried a loaded gun with him. He was reported about basically everywhere he went. Um, let's look at his background. Um, when when it, this was investigated, this incident, it was discovered that Mr. Bordeaux was a long-term alcoholic and drug user and had been hospitalized multiple times for uh, his alcoholism problem. He also suffered from severe depression and had uh, attempted suicide with a gun. Yet again, he was able to uh, legally carry a, a loaded gun wherever he wanted in the state of North Carolina. Here's another incident. Um, on, on my far right, your far left, that's Julius Burton. At 18 years old, um, he went into a, a store called Badger Guns in West Milwaukee, which is just outside of the, the border for uh, Milwaukee City. And he selected a, a Taurus 40 caliber handgun, a relatively inexpensive but quite powerful handgun. And he had with him uh, Jacob Collins, his friend, who was 21 years old. And he said, I'll take that one. That's the one I want. Um, and so um, Jacob Collins, being of legal age, could purchase this gun. One month later, um, Julius Burton used that to shoot two police officers, uh, officers Norberg and Kunich, Kunich, and they now are permanently disabled. Um, the man uh, below here, let's see if I can get my pointer. This is um, uh, Adam Allen. He was the, uh, one of the, the co-owners of Badger Guns. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more story about Badger and present some data uh, later in my talk, but uh, it's just to point out now that uh, in many year, for many years, uh, this gun store sold more guns, later traced to crime, than any in the entire United States. Mr. Um, uh, he, he also subsequently lost his license after a bunch of um, problems were revealed. So. Um, Quite often, again, when, when we, it's often prompted by these mass shootings, we start to talk about guns. And typically there's a lot of emotion, a lot of shouting, and you get um, what can conveniently be sort of categorized as people into two camps. One saying guns don't kill people, people do. It's really about people who are evil or mentally disturbed. And another group who just really hates guns and thinks we have too much of them and the problem is guns. That's a somewhat interesting debate. We can have it if you want. In my opinion, it's kept us very confused and uh, preventing us from really looking at useful solutions. So what I argue for is to shift our conversation and focus on more productive policy debates. Um, how do we keep guns from high-risk people and situations? I think that's really what it comes down to when you think about this as a public health problem that's affecting thousands and thousands of people in the United States. Um, another relevant question is, would regulating characteristics of guns lead to fewer deaths and injuries? But really, it's this first one that I think is most important where there's more evidence that you can do something about it, and this is the maybe most important thing from a political standpoint, is there's actually incredible consensus about this, and, and, and I'll, I'll get to that, and I'll, I'll show you some evidence that. So the central issues are what should disqualify someone from illegal uh, firearm possession, and something we don't talk about for how long. In many cases, these are lifelong prohibitions, I don't think they necessarily have to be in all cases, and I'll tell you why. Um, what measures are most effective in keeping guns from prohibited persons? And what are the costs and benefits of these measures, and how are they distributed? I think those really are the central questions. Um, so I'm going to very briefly walk you through some important federal gun policy. Okay, we're going to focus, the, again, the, in my opinion, the two central questions are, what should disqualify you from having a gun? And how do you keep people from the, who, uh, who are disqualified from, from having guns? 
So th this is what federal law is states uh, what the exclusion criteria are. We have a very um, not so rational policy as it comes to age restrictions, minimum age restrictions. We say that um, you have to be at least 18 years of age to legally possess a handgun or to... No, no, sir, it's actually, uh, sir, excuse me, it's actually not incorrect, and I'm going to explain what, what I mean there. Thank you. Um, if you purchase a gun from a licensed gun dealer, you must be 21 years of age to purchase a handgun. However, if you purchase one at a gun show or any other venue from a private non-licensed dealer, it's age 18 in 45 of the 50 states. So that's what it says under federal law. Uh, of course, we all know that felons are uh, prohibited. If you've been a fugitive from justice, if you've been convicted, convicted of a domestic violence um, uh, misdemeanor crime of assault, or are currently in a restraining order for domestic violence, at least most orders, not all. Um, if you use or are addicted to controlled substances, if you've been adjudicated mentally defective or committed to a mental institution or dishonorably discharged from the military. Those are the key ones. Some states extend these prohibitions, and I want to talk about this for a minute. Some set 21 as the minimum age for legal handgun possession, regardless of how you uh, acquire it. Um, we also have some states that uh, bar individuals who have been convicted of misdemeanor crimes involving violence and or misuse of guns. Um, um, actually, the majority of states now also prohibit individuals who, as juveniles, committed serious enough crimes they would have been felonies if they would have been uh, handled in the adult judicial system, uh, that they are barred typically, again, not lifelong, but for uh, anywhere from three to ten years. Uh, this varies a little bit from state to state. And then other uh, states also sometimes um, bar individuals from possessing guns if they've had multiple convictions for drug or alcohol crimes uh, that would indicate problems with substance abuse. We published a study in 2012 in which we looked at data from um, a nationally represented uh, survey of state prison inmates, and we looked at the 13 states with the uh, least strict standards uh, for legal gun possession. Arkansas was one of those 13 states. And what we found is that 40% um, that before they com committed the crime that got them in the state prison were prohibited, uh, prohibited possessors of, of guns. Um, interestingly, and, and this is probably what is most important for policy, is that nearly three out of 10, 29%, would have been legally prohibited in states with stricter standards. 31% um, uh, would have been uh, legal in, in any state in the United States. So we then asked the question, well, what, what are the things, what are the extra prohibiting conditions that um, account for most of this red piece of the pie here, those who would have been illegal in other states with stricter laws? What we find is that most importantly that it gets to the minimum age restrictions. So uh, roughly 15% were um, 21 uh, and used a handgun, uh, roughly 7% 21 and used a, a long gun, uh, having been convicted of a serious crime as, as a juvenile with the, ne with the next comment. So the, the picture here again is youthful offenders are very important in this picture, right? You know, I'm going to show you a, a little more data along. So this is the age-specific homicide offending rates. Uh, I'm sorry, probably, except for the folks sitting closest, can probably see the, the um, numbers at the bottom here. But where this peaks is, guess what? It's between 18 and, and 20. The, those, are the, those are the ages that, again, that this, uh, the places with the stricter standards set it at 21. And, and this is why I'll, this is particularly relevant. And this general curve here is why, again, what, what I think makes most sense from a public policy, public safety perspective is thinking about 
more prohibiting conditions, but not lifelong. If you're getting into a lot of problems in your younger years, this is where a lot of the problems occur. If, if you've shown for a while that you're not offending, your, your risk later in life is, is really substantially less. So I think thinking about age, when we think about this from a public uh, safety perspective, makes a lot of sense. And I think it's interesting to ask ourselves a question, which is more dangerous in the hands of 18 to 20 year olds, uh, a can of beer or a handgun? In 50 states, 21 is the minimum legal age for alcohol consumption, uh, but only five states and the District of Columbia has set 21 as the minimum legal age for possessing a handgun. Uh, other, um, other potentially prohibiting conditions, violent misdemeanors. Garrett Wendemute has done some research on this. Uh, he's updated some of this recently, but the pattern is basically the same. This idea of law-abiding gun owners. So he looked at uh, legal gun owner, um, people legally possessing uh, guns in California. And when they came to purchase their gun, they truly were law-abiding. They had no criminal history. Their offending, when they followed them over time, was really quite low. But if you had misdemeanor offenses, particularly violent misdemeanors, your risks were about eight times higher than this truly law-abiding. So again, what I'm hoping that we get to in terms of a policy discussion is, I'm okay with this truly law-abiding group having guns, and we can even talk about when and where they carry them. I'm okay with that. What I want to think about is, another set of individuals that maybe aren't so law-abiding, that aren't so low risk, and, and how we uh, address that from a public uh, safety perspective. So a question um, that uh, I think a lot of people are very skeptical about, understandably perhaps, is that can fire prohibitions for high-risk individuals work? Okay. Now, I wish we had a whole lot of research on that. We don't. But here are a few examples that sh shows that at least it can work, at least for some categories of individuals. First of all, domestic violence offenders. There have been three studies, uh, two state-level studies and one city-level study that has shown that uh, state laws that uh, prohibit those who have uh, under restraining orders for domestic violence from, from possessing firearms are associated with uh, reductions in intimate partner homicide rates anywhere from 6% to 19%. We also have evidence that when California restricted, um, went, changed its policy to restrict violent misdemeanors from being able to legally purchase and possess handguns, that the prohibited group had a lower rate of offending um, than, than the group before the law was changed, a similar group. The most recent study that was published in, in our book that, uh, led by Jeffrey Swanson looked at mental illness prohibitions in the state of Connecticut. And um, they found that uh, once the policy went into place with uh, mandatory reporting to the background check system for the mental health records that for the individuals that this was relevant, this prohibition was relevant for, you uh, cut the violent offending rate in half uh, by that, that restriction. So um, this is at least some suggestive evidence that prohibitions matter. So this brings us to this, this next question that is really not an easy one to, to wrestle with, and that is, okay, how do you keep guns from this prohibited group? And, and there's a lot of skepticism because it seems as though we, we think about these regulations that are in the legal market and are they at all relevant to what happens in the illicit market where uh, very often criminals obtain guns. So um, what do we know about this? We don't know nearly enough and I'm trying to do research that, that uh, uncovers some more about that. But um, roughly about 10% of criminals say that they stole their gun. Most commonly, they're getting it from friends or associates or some sort of street source. The ATF trafficking, gun trafficking investigation showed that the most common diversion route of guns going from legal to illegal commerce involve 
a gun dealer who's either very explicitly doing illegal acts or other activities that are you would certainly ca characterize as negligent. Uh, they're facilitating illegal straw purchasers, conspiring with traffickers, or selling guns off the books. Thankfully, this represents only a relatively small proportion of gun dealers who are the problem. We know that less than 5% of gun dealers account for 50 to 60% of guns traced to crime. And um, while, again, we don't think about it in these terms, but all these private transactions uh, that many criminals are getting guns technically could be seen as legal because the seller has no obligation, is not breaking any law by selling the gun unless that person says, oh, by the way, I'm a felon, but will you still sell me my gun? Typically, that's probably not what the exchange looks like. So many of these exchanges actually occur in some legal context under, under our current laws. Um, what are the federal regulations to keep prohibited persons from accessing firearms. First of all, uh, federal government licenses individuals who are in the business of selling firearms. Makes sense. We do mandatory background checks since the Brady Law uh, for those transactions with licensed dealers. Of course, we still have this huge gap in our laws for private transactions where we, we have no background checks or record keeping requirements. Explicitly in federal law, uh, it says that the federal government cannot maintain a registry of gun owners. Um, and dealer record keeping is required, but penalties for uh, not, in essence, being able to account for all of your guns, um, there are basically no penalties unless a federal prosecutor can uh, prove that uh, there was willful, that someone in essence was very willfully trying to evade uh, federal firearms laws. Uh, Congress also in 2005 made uh, gun sellers pretty much immune to almost all lawsuits, uh, very uncommon protection of any other legal product. Um, Congress has also placed a great deal of limits on the ATF at the urging of the gun lobby. Uh, it says that the ATF, ATF cannot consolidate records of licensed dealers. Uh, you, they are not allowed to electronically retrieve names of gun buyers from out-of-business records to aid crime gun searches. So you actually, how many people remember microfiches from public libraries or school libraries? You know, that's what they use, believe it or not, in, in this day and age, in the 21st century, because uh, they're not elect, uh, Congress is uh, forbid them to uh, put it in an electronic database so that they could do a crime gun uh, trace. Um, it also said that ATF can not require gun dealers to inventory their firearms. Uh, they're not allowed to access data from an FBI background check 24 hours after it's purchased. Um, they're not supposed to disclose data on the origin of crime guns. And um, they also allow gun dealers to transfer guns that are in their business into their private collection. So I don't know how many of you go to gun shows, but there, you might sometimes see scenarios in which an individual has a table, part of which is sort of the, the licensed dealer business, and part of it is the, the private business. So if someone comes up and wants a, a gun but doesn't want the inconvenience of a background check, that dealer can transfer it to his private collection and then sell the gun. Um, okay, does the gun lobby really, um, so often when we have these discussions and debates, uh, one side simply says, oh, we just need to enforce, we need better enforcement, right? Um, I'm a little bit skeptical about that, uh, at least as far as the gun lobby is concerned, because um, they've done a great deal to, to put restrictions on the ATF uh, to enforcing gun laws. And just to try to give a little bit of perspective here, um, so 9-11, we had 3,000 people who were murdered in the United States. And we went to war for 10 years against two different countries, spent over a trillion dollars. We created the Homeland Security Department, um, cost of about 
$649 billion last counting, hired uh, over 40,000 people in TSA to, to check us as we get on, our, on, on airplanes, and they raised the budget of just about every federal law enforcement agency except one. You got it, the ATF. Uh, since 9-11, there's been over 144,000 Americans killed with guns, murdered with guns. And since 9-11, Congress has weakened federal gun laws and ATF's authority and maintain a flat budget for the last 15 years and basically the same workforce. Um, dirty dealers face relatively little risk. Um, le uh, roughly 9% are inspected in, in any given year. When dealers are inspected, quite often more uh, violations are found, uh, but actions actually, uh, serious actions against the license are, are pretty rare, about 1%. Um, and uh, dealers who do have their license revoked uh, uh, find it pretty convenient, in essence, to get around it. So um, there's a, a gun dealer just outside the Baltimore city line. Um, Sandy Abrams ran uh, Valley Guns for many years, and um, I won't go into the long litany of his situation, but he, he was a really bad actor. And finally, after nearly 10 years, uh, they took away his license. He immediately had his 80-some-year-old mother apply for a license and set up a business right next to his, where he then transferred his inventory to his mother, and he sat in the back room, sort of in essence running the business, while Mom Abrams uh, had the dealership in her name. And that's not an uncommon scenario. Um, so states do a variety, some states do a variety of things to go beyond the federal laws. Um, some have their own set of regulations and oversight over gun dealers. Uh, they have purchase permit applications that you have to go to a law enforcement agency rather than the individual who stands to profit from, your, uh, from the sale that um, vets the, the application process, including fingerprinting in some cases. Um, they require background checks for all gun sales. They require reporting, uh, mandatory uh, reporting of theft, uh, loss of guns, and uh, restrictions like one handgun per month per person. Uh, so we've done some uh, studies that looked at the effects of these state policies on the diversion of guns to criminals. Uh, first looking at intrastate diversions of guns to criminals and then cross-border and we find some similar uh, findings. We find that when a state has strong, strong gun dealer regulations, and importantly, we're the first researchers to do this, to actually study the enforcement part of this, it turns out that having strong gun dealer regulations by itself did not have independent effect. It's when there were regular audit inspections keeping track of what these folks are doing that you had a very significantly less diversion of guns to criminals uh, shortly after a retail sale. We also find, found that private uh, uh, sales regulations, uh, background checks for private sales, for example, significantly reduced in-state diversions, adds the discretionary permit to purchase licensing. When we looked at the export of, of guns uh, across state lines in relation to state gun laws, we found that Discretionary permit to purchase licensing significantly reduced uh, diversion, as did um, less restrictive permit to purchase licensing with fingerprinting. Uh, universal background checks, private sales background checks, mandatory theft and loss reporting for gun owners, and bans of junk guns or Saturday night specials, all were associated with much Few, many fewer guns exported per capita uh, to criminals. The, the two studies I referred to just a minute ago were, were both cross-sectional studies that have limitations in terms of causal inference. I want to uh, point out a, a more recent study that, that we've under, undertaken looking at change over time in the state of Missouri when they got rid of some, of the, some key um, regulations. 
they uh, repealed their permit to purchase handgun licensing law in August of 2007 so that private handgun sales no longer required a background check and uh, you no longer had to go to local sheriff to get your permit. You just simply went to the gun dealer to fill out your form to get the gun. So what happened? Uh, I apologize, this is, there, there are a lot of bars here, but um, I'll briefly just describe what this is. This is the amount of time in between a retail sale and a recovery um, of a gun from a criminal. And um, up to three months, so three months or less is the yellow bar, three to 12 months is red, and this, the blue is one to two years. These are all unusually short intervals between retail sale and involvement in crime. What you see here in relation to when this law changed, which is in the latter part of 2007, what you would expect is that the only thing changing much here is this first yellow bar because uh, it was mostly that's when the law went into effect. And you see a little uptick right here that gets bigger as you extend forward when the law uh, has been repealed for a longer period of time. Similarly, the red bar changes, shifts up. Uh, basically, there's a close concordance with the diversion of guns to criminals, a big spike upward, and the repeal of this law that, that patterned precisely with uh, the, the repeal of the law. Similarly, th this tracks the proportion of guns coming from within the state that, that were sold at retail level in state in, on the yellow line and out of state at the red line. And following the implementation of this law, you saw a big increase in in-state guns. So uh, this big increase in short interval crimes from retail sale to crime involvement principally were coming from the Missouri gun dealers. Most importantly, we've, we track the gun homicide rates, age-adjusted um, gun homicide rates in Missouri following their repeal of this law and contrasted it with other, other states. And um, Missouri, Missouri again here is in the yellow and you see a, a, a prominent upswing whereas nationally and in the Midwest it's going down. So if you just sort of break this all down and you compare the mean rate, gun homicide rates um, before and after the law went into effect, you see Missouri's had a 25% increase whereas there was little change in most other places. Most states were trending down. Arkansas had a very slight increase over that time period of 2008 to 2010. Uh, so something very unique happened in Missouri. It seemed to be quite coincident with the repeal of this law. Um, we also, we did some regression analysis where we controlled for baseline levels of gun homicide rates, the age structures of the population, police per capita, incarceration rates, unemployment, and burglary as a general measure for, for how much crime is going on in, in an area. And uh, Missouri's permit to purchase repeal was associated with a 29% increase in gun homicide rates when you controlled for stand your ground laws uh, that affect diminished just very slightly to uh, 26 percent increase we also just you know if if for example this was mainly explained by something in st louis you know there was a big upswing in violence in st louis but the rest of the state nothing is going on but what we found is when we looked at every major jurisdiction, county or, or in the city of, of St. Louis, every metropolitan area had very substantial increases in gun homicide rates exactly coincident with the change uh, repeal of this law. How am I doing on time here? So um, I, I'm going to, the rest stuff I'm going to go a little bit quicker, but um, this gets to this, this idea of, of regulating and oversight of gun sellers. Um, in the late 1990s, uh, the city of Chicago as well as the city of Detroit uh, both did something very similar. They, did, they staged undercover stings of gun shops 
that were fueling a lot of the, the violence, that a lot of the, the guns used in crime were coming from these gunshots. They did undercover stings where they had very blatant uh, staged straw purchases. And in many of the dealers, they went along and made those transactions nevertheless. And the city then sued those dealers. This is before uh, the federal government changed the law to prohibit, prohibit such lawsuits. Um, uh, New York City uh, did some, something similar in 2006, but uh, their focus was out-of-state dealers because most of their guns used in the city were coming outside of state. Uh, but they, again, they were staging these undercover stings where they were videotaping what was going on and then uh, suing, um, suing the gun dealers. We then tracked the uh, diversion of crimes, uh, excuse me, diversion of guns to criminals shortly after retail sale. And in Chicago, for the guns coming from within state dealers, there was a decline, 62% decline, following the announcement of these uh, undercover stings and lawsuits. In Detroit, it was 36% decline. New York City, we had different kind of data. We had data uh, from um, actual number of guns sold by a subset of the dealers who had electronic records. So 10 of the 20-some uh, dealers who uh, settled in these lawsuits uh, provided data on number of guns they were selling and then subsequently looking at guns uh, recovered by the NYPD from criminals. And there was a remarkable 82% decline in the rate of, of guns per, you know, accounting for the number of guns being sold. So again, I think there's a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that Retailers can alter their practice to minimize the likelihood that their guns, the guns they're selling, are ending up in the hands of criminals, which is what we most care about. Um, okay, favors for the gun dealers. Uh, in um, 2003, Representative Todd Tiart um, from, from the state of Kansas um, pushed through as part of a appropriation rider some, um, some amendments that um, initially just prohibited ATF from sharing data on crime guns sold by dealers. The industry was kind of getting beat up by a lot of the data coming out uh, on some of the gun dealers. Um, and then they later expanded some of these uh, restrictions uh, requiring uh, they prohibited ATF from requiring dealers to do a physical inventory, and, and they also uh, required FBI to destroy the records from background checks within 24 hours. Um, there were also other expanses of, of, of limiting how crime gun trace could be used in, in administrative hearings on licenses of gun dealers. When Representative Tiart was asked why he was motivated to uh, to, to put this legislation through, his response was, I have a lot of friends who are gun dealers. That's why I titled this favor for gun dealers. Uh, getting back to this case story of Badger Guns, remember that was the, the store where the 21-year-old bought the gun for the 18-year-old who shot the police officers. Badger Guns is a very interesting case study that we've been interested in over, over a good number of years. Um, we tracked um, the, the, these squiggly lines, this solid line is the number of guns that had been sold by Badger guns and, and used in crime with, in less than a year, okay? And this is this, uh, the sale date um, periods. So what happened here where it fell off like a cliff? Interesting, you know what happened? ATF released, released a report that showed that Badger Guns led the nation as the number one seller of crime guns. Within two days, the, the dealer announced some changes in their gun sales practices, and you had this very prominent decline in the rate of their guns getting into the hands of criminals. That carried on for a short amount of time, and then Representative Tiart came in with his amendments and his, his buddies passed these amendments. And um, guess what? Things started to change quite rapidly. We, we estimated using some regression analyses. Uh, oh, the other thing important is this dotted line is all the other gun dealers, okay? So 
There was some substitution effect when Badger got its act in line, but it didn't make up for uh, this big drop off. This is overall a 44% decline in these diverted guns. Um, but when Badger's had a, this is a 200% increase, okay, from before to after, um, whereas no change in these other dealers. So basically, in my opinion, the point is that these protections that Representative TR put through are protecting bad dealers who probably don't deserve it. And the good dealers, they don't need protection. They're probably not doing anything wrong. Um, now, let, let's end this discussion on, on thinking about the, the politics of this. Getting back to this cultural debate, pro-gun, anti-gun. That's what we always think about. Pro-gun assumes, okay, we got all the gun owners on one side, anti-guns, you got all these pointy-headed liberals in urban areas or whatever, right? So, I don't know where I come from because, I, as I said, I'm from Kentucky, but I'm, anyway. So, uh, this doesn't show up as well as I would like it to, I apologize, but this, this column is for gun owners, and this is NRA members, and, and first we, I'm showing you five policy about supporting higher standards for legal gun ownership, and what you'll see here is that um, from, except, well, you have 52 percent of gun owners saying that 21 should be the minimum age for a handgun uh, purchase and possession, but for these other restrictions where we're looking at uh, someone violating a restraining order for domestic violence, publicly displaying a weapon in a threatening manner, uh, committing a serious crime in his juvenile, you've got 70 to 80 percent of gun owners who want stronger standards in those areas, and even a majority who want 21 at the minimum legal age. Even if you look at the NRA members, you see again very strong support for most of these uh, stronger um, uh, in essence, higher standards for legal gun ownership. Uh, only 42%, however, supported 21 as a legal age. Now, the other part of this, measures to keep guns from prohibited individuals. Let's look at five key policies here and how do gun owners and NRA members feel about them. Well, guess what? Again, you see that this is the gun owner column here. You've got anywhere from 59% to 84% when it comes to background checks for all gun sales. Who, who support these sort of policies to make it more difficult for prohibited individuals to get guns. And again, even NRA members agree with many of these, not all, but many of these provisions. So a way forward that, that I, I hope that we see is that we get away from our cultural war that isn't helping. It really isn't helping anything at all. Um, we really should be having a policy discussion. And we should be thinking about, rather than always just focus on what we disagree on, assault weapons, concealed carry, those are areas where there's not consensus, okay? But it turns out that those two issues, assault weapons and concealed carry, that seem to kind of absorb 95% of the discussion, in terms of public safety, they, they, they mean little to nothing in terms of empirical support. What matters principally is what I'm talking about here is the standards for legal gun ownership and how do you keep guns from prohibited individuals. Let's focus our time and attention on what we agree on and what is important. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end there so that we have some time for questions and uh, the dean All right, we do have time for questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. And if you'll, if you'll wait uh, till, till the microphone gets to you, we'll, this question right over here, and the microphone coming at you. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming, Doctor. Sure, thank you. Uh, I did a little background check and research on, uh, on your research. I favor background checks. <laughs> Maybe that's why you didn't shoot a gun after you were 11. The John Hopkins Center for Gun Policy and Research was created to do research on gun violence and is funded by the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, Baltimore, Maryland. The majority of funding, and this is to be credited to him, 1.1 billion over several decades 
has been contributed by Michael Bloomberg, the current mayor of New York and the co-chair of Mayors Against Illegal Guns, which is the most aggressive pro-gun control organization in the country. So as a uh, retired law enforcement federal agent and a lifelong member of the NRA, I'd like to say that your statistics, which can be made to say anything if you've ever done research, are questionable to me, and they should be questionable to anyone who sees your presentation. Thank you very much. That was a comment, not a question. Please make questions, please. Uh, yes, we have a question right back here. Please, please make questions. Hi, I'm Anna Strong. I'm actually a Clinton School graduate from a few years ago um, and a public health graduate as well, so I appreciated your presentation today. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, I know you, you mentioned the drinking age, legal drinking age in all 50 states um, is at 21, or most, most of the states is at um, 21, and I know that was originally tied to federal highway funding, right. a big fiscal um, encouragement, I guess, if you will, from sure. the federal government for states to raise their drinking age. Are there, do you have any suggestions that of a similar sort to help um, to help with uh, states moving forward on um, on their policies on guns? Well, you know, conceivably, <clears throat> um, federal government could do similar kind of things as it relates to minimum age uh, or, or other kind of conditions. However, I think that the hurdles for, the political hurdles for um, stronger gun laws um, are, are not small at the federal level. And, um, I, I hope that that will change, but um, it's, it's something that maybe is, is worth considering down the line. Uh, I, I think generally what makes most sense is to sort of set certain federal standards um, that uh, have, have generally held up. Um, you know, anything that I'm talking about here, I mean, my intention was not to get into a debate upon, on, on the Second Amendment or Constitution, but th these are all well within what Anthony Scalia is, says is completely constitutional. So th these are regulations put in place, uh, again, principally to keep guns from dangerous people. So, um, so I think that I think that we can we can make ground on on these things. Uh, again, if we can um, not have the whole discussion sort of steered by the gun lobby, which I think uh, very intentionally wants us to continue to, this, to have the cultural debate. They don't want to have the policy debate. They want the cultural debate. Yes, ma'am, right here, question, right here. First of all, a quick question. Did um, Skip tell you that Wayne LaPierre was standing where you were within the last year? Yeah, I did understand, that's fine. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you, in states such as ours, I grew up in Tennessee, you in Kentucky, and now I live in Arkansas, states where there's a great deal of hunting, do you think any kind of differentiation between long guns and concealable handguns might draw more people into being in favor of restrictions? Oh, without a doubt, that's a great point. And uh, if you look at many state policies, including in Maryland where I'm from, um, far more regulations are on handguns than on our long guns. We exempted in the state of Maryland for many years m almost all regulations on the long guns, principally in essence to, we have the same divide in, in, in cultural debate within Maryland and when I go to Annapolis and listen to those discussions, it's typically rural folks talking about their hunting and other things and people from places like Baltimore where handguns are the problem. And so they, they, they came to common sense kind of um, agreements that, yeah, we, we need stronger measures on handguns than we do on long guns. Um, it's not a perfect um, answer, but it, it seems to be reasonable to try to, uh, in essence, cross the cultural divide. Yes, sir, right here. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions that actually address statistics, uh, just to kind of help clarify things. The first is you gave data on the number of deaths and hospital treated by guns or as a result of guns in criminal activity. Right. Do you have similar data on deaths and hospital treated 
by, because, as a result of gun injury in non-crime uh, situations and whether these laws would have an impact on that? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> So as my slide pointed out, so 19,000 uh, deaths a year are from suicide. Um, the, if you look at the non-fatal numbers, uh, they definitely skew the lion's share is from criminal assault types of behavior. Uh, unintentional or accidental types of shooting, whether they're fatal or non-fatal, make up a relatively small proportion of this. Uh, one study that I uh, did looked at uh, child access prevention laws, or laws that require gun owners to store guns safely, typically locked in some fashion, so that they're not accessible um, to, to underage youth. And we found that uh, that significantly reduced adolescent suicides. We also, just to, just to point out our objectivity, we found that uh, three other types of laws focused on youth firearm restrictions had no impact on youth suicide. So we report our data and findings whether they support more regulation or do not. Questions? Uh, different groups put out statistics about gun violence. I wonder if in your research you've ever um, found information about whether the statistics put out by the National Rifle Association or organizations they support are funded by organizations which profit by fewer gun regulations. I'm not sure exactly how, how to address the, the question. I mean, the, the NRA gets a lot of money from the gun industry. I know that. Uh, whether that influences the data that they put out or don't, I, I really don't know. Um, I tend to try to focus on, on science, objective, and data, and not who's funding who. And, and by the way, the, the fact that Mayor Bloomberg gives a lot of money to my university, uh, he doesn't pay my salary, he doesn't tell me what to do. I publish stuff that he doesn't like, probably. I don't know, I've never, he's never told me anything nor has my president or dean or anybody try to direct me to make Michael Bloomberg happy. So I was doing my research on guns far before Michael Bloomberg ever discovered the issue. So I just want to make that crystal clear that um, I, I am following data and I'm putting my data through scientific peer review process. Uh, so just to be clear about that. All right, uh, we've got, we got, we got time for one more question. To what extent do other uh, public health initiatives like uh, stopping the use of tobacco serve as a model for trying to achieve some of the public health goals that you're talking about? It's an excellent question. I, I was talking uh, before, um, before, before we had this session about, uh, I actually have a whole class uh, devoted to public health strategies being applied to violence broadly, not just guns. And we draw lessons from a lot of different things. So um, we draw some lessons from uh, successful efforts to reduce motor vehicle crashes, whether it's through um, drunk driving legislation or changes in the designs of cars. And, 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 and so the focus on changing products, they're, they're, we think, um, can be useful in, in reducing at least some kinds of gun violence. Another successful model that's been applied that I've studied in Baltimore uh, comes from an infectious disease control process, interestingly enough, because we find that gun violence tends to spread much like a social contagion. And some of the uh, measures to address it through changing behaviors of the things that propagate, in essence, the, the gun violence um, are effective. So. Um, for example, hiring ex-gang members who have reformed to mediate disputes and start to change social norms about how you deal with conflicts and provocations rather than pulling out a gun. Um, we found significantly reduced violence in some of Baltimore's most dangerous neighborhoods. So we're looking from a lot of different vantage points to different public health 
analogies and in essence sort of trying it on and say, does this work, yes or no, and, and testing it under empirical research. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's thank Dr. Daniel Webster.